my mic first. Hello and uh, welcome. Good afternoon. This is Maria Maimon and you're watching the Bad Lab uh, live session. Today's topic is paralysis uh, and dysfunction. So we're going to hold this conversation um, with a very, very esteemed guest of ours, Adam Weinstein. He's come all the way from Washington and uh, the uh, whole, um, you know, the whole conversation will revolve around um, the similarities that Adam and I kind of see between the American pa Pakistani political uh, spectrum at the moment. Uh, Adam and I had a chat before starting the session and you, you, it's unbelievably interesting how different we are yet so alike on so many levels. So I probably will start with Adam introducing himself to those people who have just joined in would get to know uh, where uh, what Adam does, uh, what his area of expertise is. So over to you, Adam. Uh, thanks, Maria. And I think you're a more esteemed uh, guest uh, than I am. But uh, I'm a research fellow at the Quincy Institute, which is a, uh, a think tank in, in uh, DC that focuses on a more diplomacy focused, uh, that advocates for a more diplomacy focused foreign policy in the United States with less military intervention. And I'm also a non-resident fellow here at Tabad Lab itself. Uh, and I'm excited to be here in person. Uh, and uh, my background is that formerly I was a, a US Marine and I'm also an attorney. So I have kind of a multidisciplinary background and I've been coming to Pakistan for at least the last five years and it's a country that uh, continues to interest me and uh, a country that has a special place in my heart as well. Um, so why don't you... Uh, why why interests you about Pakistan so much? You've been coming here back and forth since five years. So uh, what actually got you, you know, really interested in Pakistan? And well, you know, I, I like difficult problems, but I like I like uh, I, I like solving problems that I think have a solution. And I believe Pakistan has real potential. I, you know, it's projected to be the third most populous country by 2050. It also has uh, real dysfunction, which we're going to talk about today. But um, I think the potential outweighs the dysfunction. And I think the U.S. Pakistan relationship is one that's very important and one that is, is sometimes undervalued. And I think that's what attracted me uh, to Pakistan uh, from an academic or analytical perspective. But on a personal level, I think Pakistanis are some of the most generous uh, people in the world. I've, I've traveled to over 35 countries, and I know it's a cliche to say Pakistanis are generous, but they truly are the most generous people I have ever interacted with. And it is a deep, rich, diverse culture and country. And, and so on a personal level, I, I like being here. Yeah, and also, uh, we're uh, so much, uh, you know, um, in the center of action all the time. You'll see so much political development, so much, uh, you know, judicial activism and upheaval around that. So uh, probably a good case study for you also. So before we started the session, Adam, we kind of like chatted for a couple of, you know, uh, moments about the similarities that you and I kind of see in the American and Pakistani society. And a couple of points that you brought up, it just they just shocked me. For example, let's start from the point where you told me that uh, the average American has this um, identity crisis problem in 2022. Because as a Pakistani, we do have a very, very deep rooted identity crisis. But at least I understand the reasons where it comes from. Of course, in, uh, I'm going to share it with you also. But where does this identity crisis of the modern American comes from? Because uh, isn't the American exceptionalism something that's binding you all together? So this was something that was quite uh, interesting for me. That's why I'm just starting with it. Well, I, I'm going to say something here that is, I think, not said very often, and maybe I'll have to defend this position. But at the end of the day, both the United States and Pakistan are, in essence, post-colonial nation, nations. Now, the post-colonial Pakistani experience and the trauma of partition, I think, is much more intense than in many ways and much uh, closer to the current generation of Pakistanis than the revolutionary war experience of the United States. But at the end of the day, these are countries that were born out of ideas more than uh, territory or history. Uh, and, and so we have these uh, ideas that were formulated at the inception of, of our respective countries' uh, formations. And those ideas are, are what supposedly binds what is otherwise very um, diverse and often divided uh, populations. And so the question in the year 2022 is, can those ideas uh, overcome the divisiveness that we see in our respective societies? 
Hmm. But uh, I understand the American diversiveness because obviously uh, it's also a melting point. A lot of people, a lot of immigrants have made what America it is today. Pakistan, on the other hand, we're very exclusive. We just want to be very, very Muslim, very, very Pakistani and ideally more Punjabi <laughs> rather than, you know, uh, so the and major, uh, Punjabis are a majority over here. They're mostly calling the shots. The policy is being made by them in this country. So I do uh, still what how would you, uh, you know, kind of like uh, take us through this? Uh, what kind of divisiveness um, are we talking about there? Well, look, the divisions in the United States even exist within uh, ethnic groups and there are regional divisions and there's, there's political divisions just as there are in Pakistan. I mean, granted, Pakistan doesn't have the kind of diversity that the United States has, but from a South Asian perspective, it is quite diverse. I mean, you're spending a day in Karachi and you'll see how, how many uh, different languages are spoken. I think D.I. Khan, just a few hours away, it has how many languages spoken, what, 10 languages, something like that. Um, you, there are, yeah, it's a, you could argue, and I think the, the common narrative, it, it is a Punjabi dominated state, yeah. you know, historically, but, but um, other groups are even over represented in certain institutions, uh, uh, such, such as uh, Pashtuns in the military, for example. Um, so there, there is a real diversity here, a regional diversity, um, a provincial diversity, an ethnic diversity. And even though the majority of Pakistanis are Muslim, there's even uh, a religious diversity uh, so within, within Islam. Uh, and within the understandings of Islam. So I, I, I think, yes, is it a comparable diversity to the United States? No, but these same divisions, these same tensions, the same uh, barriers to, to communal harmony still exist. Mm. And again, what's most important about my point, I think, is that these are two countries that were based on an idea, not yeah. based on necessarily a historical territory or, or, you know, they're relatively new countries in the grand scheme of things. Granted, Pakistan is much newer than the United States, but they're relatively new countries that were based on an idea and, and based on charismatic founding fathers, so to speak. It's interesting because uh, the Pakistani identity crisis, uh, it uh, stems from a couple of factors that were artificially injected in the Pakistani society. For example, it has a lot to do with our foreign policy. So uh, when we became closer to Saudi, um, we tried to out Arab the Arabs. So when you see uh, Pakistanis being uh, more friendlier towards the Arab nations, so uh, somehow our, the joint history of Muslims became our history. We kind of ignored the regional history that we had, the core shared history with the other religions and other ethnicities in this area. So we were more leaning towards, um, you know, the Muslim joint heritage and the Saudis came to help in that, at that time, that ideology helped us. Recently, a couple of years ago, uh, our policy makers became very obsessed with the Turkish school of thought. And um, a very deliberate effort was made to import and dub Turkish dramas and uh, they were played on PTV in, in the mainstream medias. Those Turkish stars became superheroes in Pakistan. They would get a lot of endorsements. People wanted to see them. So that was also because the policy maker at that time, let's say it was Imran Khan, he thought that, you know, the Turkish Muslim roots are something that we feel more comfortable with. So for us, the identity crisis is not organic. It has, it's pretty much artificial and it depended on the whims of the policy makers of those times. So, for example, if you ask an average Pakistani man today on the road, they will tell you they are Muslims, they are Pakistanis, and then they will tell you their ethnicity. This is in Punjab. It's different in the other, you know, provinces. So I clearly remember once Sherry Rahman, she was a minister. She's a very prominent figure. She's a minister of, uh, uh, you know, uh, climate change these days. She was on a television show and she said, I'm a Pakistani first and then I'm a Muslim. And there was a lot of criticism over that because people expected her to be Muslim first and then Pakistani. So that is the kind of identity crisis a regular person, an average man, uh, you know, kind of is, is facing in Pakistan right now. What is specifically, for example, if I ask you, if you ask a young person in the streets of New York or L.A., what is his exact existential crisis? Now, ours is because we're so confused. The state has told us multiple times, no, 
you we should more emulate the saudi model or you know their history is something because it's also in the holy scriptures that is something we should be leaning towards and suddenly you know someone inspired by new ideology just takes us in another direction now the turkish and the saudi ideologies are poles apart if you you know talk in terms of their overall code of life whatever they follow but what about you know in the us well first thing i'd say is i would implore everyone not to just talk to folks in new york and la i've lived in both cities i love both cities but you know it would be important to talk to people in indiana west virginia florida alabama uh, massachusetts uh, that you know the united states is huge i'd also say that i think most identity most national identity crises are artificial in the, in the way you're using the word because they have to do with how people view their identity in their country within the broader world and so the same thing exists in the united states you you'll have plenty of americans who will say yes i'm an american that's my identity but their definition of what it means to be an american is increasingly different um especially as we become a di more diverse society especially as uh there's regional divisions and so people can agree on what it means to be that they are american first and that's their identity and 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 you know i think a lot of pakistanis i talked to would would argue well uh being a muslim is 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 so inextricably linked to pakistani identity that of of course to have one without the other just isn't natural i don't want to speak for them but those that's what i've heard when i talk to many people although we have to recognize pakistan also has uh non-muslim you know minorities yes. who are quite patriotic but uh in the case of the united states i think the average young person would say yes i'm an american and that would be their primary identity but they wouldn't have a common definition of what that means hmm mm. that's very interesting um let's move on to the other points that we you know kind of touched upon while we were having this conversation you mentioned there's a huge sentiment and there's a chunk of discontented youth and their disconnect from the elite policy makers in the country that is precisely what pakistan is going through right now uh, we just had our you know um by elections recently and there was a change in power back in april where one elected government was sent home through the power of vote in the parliament uh, the validity and the legitimacy of that whole move is still questioned because in pakistan a lot of decisions are not exactly what they seem at the surface there's a lot going on in the background for in this case we, there's a strong belief that military establishment was the one who initiated this so called democratic move so for us um the, the there is a visible anger there is a very very uh how do i put it people are very openly criticizing it and they are showing their discontent from this whole ideology of politics that has been followed in this country for the past 75 years at least i see something very different happening this time around so uh, how do you see it since you're in pakistan i would want to know your view and then i will take this conversation to dc again my view of the situation in pakistan you mean right now uh, because you the, the disconnect between the you know youth and the uh, political elite that is wheeling doing the wheeling and the dealing and the helms of the fairs that they are at well look i think in both countries is a disconnect between the older generation of political elites and this ballooning population of people who are under 30 years old and uh granted there's a privilege to to being an american in the sense of economic opportunity and upward mobility but at the end of the day americans under 30 years old are experiencing crippling student debt they're graduating graduating into recessions i graduated uh high school into a recession and then i graduated college into a minor recession and the young people today who graduated college during the covid uh pandemic graduated into a recession uh where there wasn't any hiring and uh, you know they're fa and, and they're facing some of them are facing six figure student debt and it 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 feels that the government isn't serving our interests and i think obviously in pakistan you look at the unemployment rates for young people and the lack of opportunity even for a very qualified young people and the the widespread perception which i think is based on reality that you need nepotism to succeed in this in this country in pakistan i mean and i think that's disheartening and i think the response of the older political elite has been shut up you don't know what you want you don't know anything and and this and and this this uh this condescension and i think they've forgotten that time is passing and and uh 
you know, people who are 30 years old are, are not 18 year olds sitting in, you know, a, a college dormitory. They, they are people who want to be part of the economy and want to see a future. And I think there's an incredibly deep resentment within the young populations of both countries that the older generation of policymakers simply don't quite grasp. Hmm. It's very interesting because in Pakistan, the younger people, they do not feel they are represented enough. They don't feel that they're heard enough uh, by those people who are calling the shots in this country. For example, uh, look at the lot of all the politicians that are making the decisions in all these big parties. Even uh, the average age group is above 60 right now. And they are completely disconnected from Generation Z that is going to be in the workforce or is going to be in the public sphere very, very soon. Uh, so that tier of connect with the mid-level leadership that was supposed to be groomed, that leadership was not prepared in time. So still, it's we have 60-year-old and you know older people calling the shots. So the younger generation does not feel heard. They do not feel that they are being represented. Pakistan is a very young country and a lot of young new voters are going to come into the you know, a voting cycle in 2023. This is where, you know, all the parties right now uh, need to work on. Imran Khan led Pyaksan Tehri Kin Saab has somewhat tapped into that, you know, new voter, um, uh, you know, uh, potluck, but not, and the others have, are just far behind. Uh, they're still doing the politics by the playbook of the 1990s, which was probably the, not a very, probably I'll call it the dark area of Pakistani politics where uh, political forces kind of overthrew each other just to get closer to the establishment. So this time around, things are different because Pakistani population, especially the youth, is kind of very much invested in the political process. And they understand that the only way they will be heard is if they come out and vote. This trend that we've been seeing in we also saw in the past election cycle and probably it's going that it's going the percentage of young people coming out and voting is going to increase in the 2023 cycle of the elections that we're seeing so uh, this is what the pakistani youth is thinking right now the kind of political tactics these parties are using they're still very old school the way military establishment wants to bend them and use them and kind of maneuver these political parties to keep their grasp on the uh, power in Pakistan. That playbook is also very old. That needs to be updated also. And I don't see there's introspection in the military establishment. As of right now, probably this recent tidal wave might make them change some policies. Because right now, there is a genuine legitimacy crisis. No political party is ready to accept the other one. The military establishment was sort of the arbitrator, or they were the kind of, uh, you know, the truce makers. They have also lost legitimacy, the judiciary, a lot of questions are being asked about them. So right now in Pakistan, no single political or non-political actor has the kind of, you know, respect or legitimacy to take this system forward at the moment. And I think it almost sounds like you're describing the United States in many ways. I'd say that the, the old guard of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party is also still in the politics of, of the 90s. Um, it was a different period in the United States, but they haven't quite uh, evolved. And so they're appealing to voters who they think are reliable. And there's this perception that, well, young people won't vote. But I do think that Generation Z is changing that. I think Generation Z across the world is more engaged at a younger age than any generation before them. And, and some of that has to do with social media and uh, just greater exposure to the world and politics. And we'll have to see if they take it to the ballot box. Um, because that will be where, or, or to the to, to the streets, because I think that's where change uh, will come from. But I do think that uh, traditional political parties need to be paying attention to that if they hope to, to continue succeeding. And of course, the institution of the Supreme Court, whether you agree with their recent decisions or not, in the United States, I mean, ha has, has is under fire. There's there's many Americans who feel this is an institution that is no is is not representative um, and not even and 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 the, the Supreme Court justices who, who are sitting on the bench uh, didn't get there through a democratic process. Now, some 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 people, uh, especially certain conservatives, are very supportive of the makeup of the Supreme Court right now. So I don't want to 
draw with a broad brush. But I think mm. the Supreme Court in the United States is getting receiving more criticism than, than ever before. But what's even more important is that Americans are saying, look, we don't want to rely on the Supreme Court to sort of determine our rights. We want our lawmakers to go out and legislate. Whether you're a conservative or, or liberal, we, you know, they want their lawmakers to go out and fight for them. And there's this feeling that lawmakers haven't been doing that. And in the case of the, the military, of course, the, the U.S. military um, plays a different role in domestic politics, but I think it has, uh, and I think, you know, in terms of veterans and in terms of uh, service members, they still garner a lot of respect just as they do in, mm. in Pakistan. But Americans are tired of the way our military has been used to conduct unhinged interventions around the world while, while Americans at home suffer. So there is this lack of confidence in institutions across the board in the United States as well. So there is, there is a common thread there. It might be a different case, but it, and there might be different causes for this lack of confidence. But confidence in institutions in the United States from the Electoral College uh, to, the, to the Supreme Court, uh, to Congress, I think is, is in decline. That's a very interesting thing because uh, sitting in Pakistan, we do give a lot of examples of the British and American system, how they're so strong and how, how we should also strengthen our institutions on those lines of, you know, because the way these countries are run. In, 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 uh, sitting in Pakistan, another interesting thing that we see is that, you know, the faces, the political at least aspect of uh, and the faces associated with these parties, they always change after four years. So there's no stagnation. Uh, for example, if uh, the Democratic Party will come across uh, with a new leader after every four years, unless there's an incumbent president, then of course, they, he would continue. Uh, and they have to fight it out in the party to kind of covet that presidential ticket. Um, whereas in Pakistan, it's, it's completely different. You know, it's handed down to you from your mom or your dad or whoever inherited the party uh, so the faces do not change literally right now the pri prime minister of this country is somebody who i know since 1991 because he's here since your third you know more than 25 years and he's a prime minister again and now i i'm a millennial i'll be older soon and then gen z will come and gen x will uh, you know the, and, and millennials were okay with but gen z is not okay with it they're like how can a man who's nearly 70 uh, rule us? So the- Well, I'd we back on that a little bit, Maria, if I, if I may. I mean, I, certainly we don't have the level of dynastic politics that Pakistan has in the United States, but look at our mm -hmm. Congress. We have people who have been serving for decades. We have people in their late mm -hmm. 70s and early 80s uh, holding very powerful positions in the, in the party that arguably have more influence long-term over uh, America's political direction than, than uh, uh, the president does. So yes, we might have a change in faces in the White House, although e even those faces tend to be quite old um, with all due respect to them. But uh, I, I think there, there really is, a, there really is this, this feeling in the United States that there are people who have been serving for decades who, who, who shouldn't necessarily be serving anymore. And that's why you see, if you look at polling, a greater number of Americans are advocating for term limits in Congress because they feel that uh, our lawmakers go to Congress, they spend decades there, they get comfortable, they become disconnected from the American people. And it's not necessarily their fault. If you're sitting in a position of power for decades, how could you possibly be connected to the American people? At some point, a, a, a distance forms. So we do have that issue in the United States, albeit we don't have the exact same faces as head, head of state. That's very interesting because uh, sitting in Pakistan, I do not understand the American gun problem, honestly. <laughs> and uh, whenever there's a mass shooting at some level, uh, it's happening almost every week now. And um, how does American Congress does not come up with a solution for that? That is beyond my understanding. Could you just help us understand this little bit? Why is it such a, a unsolvable problem when lives are being lost, especially small kids? Is the disconnect too much that even that does not kind of just shakes them from their uh, conservative positions? Well, look, this is what I mean when I say that the United States does have an identity crisis. And you can ask folks if, you know, what's your identity? I'm an American, but that means different things. So look, mm -hmm. every there's no American who's so callous that they would say we don't sympathize with the uh, well, there might be a few, but most Americans wouldn't be so callous as to say we don't sympathize with the families who have lost children in school shootings uh, or who have lost uh, or mass shootings uh, wherever else. I mean, 
as an American, I think it's pathetic that we can't have a 4th of July parade without there being a, ma a mass shooting. Where the disconnect presents itself is in, well, what is the policy solution to this? So uh, there's a large segment of the population that, that believes that uh, the Second Amendment uh, should be taken in, in quite a literal way and, and that to uh, chisel away at that meaning through any kind of restrictions uh, it would, would, would open up a Pandora's box or an unraveling of the Constitution or an unraveling of, of U.S. society such that it's better to contend with these mass shootings than to, to risk uh, losing our, our rights. And then there's uh, many other people who, who believe, look, we can't accept this chaos that we're seeing in our country. Um, and and you know we uh, we absolutely need to have gun reforms now. And those those two Americas are having trouble talking to one another. And then look, there's also a societal. Um, and I don't want to get too deep into to, to gun rights and, and gun laws because I'm not an expert on it. But there's there's a cultural element too. Like look, we are a violent society. I think we need to accept that. And we're an alienated society. Uh, and, and there is a, in some ways, a lack of community and a lack of cohesion. Uh, there's a mental health crisis. Um, and and, and there's, a, you, there's a great number of Americans who are living on the edge. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and that is what you, and, and, and you can also, look, there's a white supremacy element to all of this as well, too. Uh -huh. If you look at some of the mass shootings and the stated motivations of the mass shooters are very much in line with white supremacist ideology. And that's, and they might be, mentally unwell themselves, but the, ide the ideology they're channeling is white supremacist ideology. So there's, mm -hmm. there's many different factors that are, are creating these mass shootings. And look, it's not always a, a product of, uh, of, of white supremacy either. There's, there's plenty of uh, other motivations that have led to, to um, mass shootings. My point is there's no simple explanations. But I think the way you explained it to me, how there are two Americas and they need to talk to each other. And that's where the problem lies. I think this sums up your, your I, I think this is a good perspective that uh, anybody who's watching this conversation would have. Another favorite term of mine that I think, I think this is something that we, we do share a similarity in uh, uh, your tryst or your, <laughs> your flirtation with populism <laughs> and the leadership that, uh, you know, America elected back, you know, in, in the last term in the, you know, in the form of Donald Trump, because I remember I was in the news studio and when this news broke, I just could not believe it. Um, as a Pakistani for us, with all our problems and all our own, uh, you know, inadequacies, that was quite a moment for us sitting here and observing it uh, in Islamabad. Yeah, I think populism emerges when when the technocrats fail, and uh, we've we saw years and decades of, of 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 policy failure. And again, folks will look to simple solutions. Some some people will say, "Look, Donald Trump is strictly a product of some sort of white supremacist uh, wave in the country." And you know, some of his supporters were white supremacists, but he also had plenty of supporters that weren't even weren't even white. So I think there's multiple explanations for why populist messages emerge. Um, and it's, 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 it's difficult to explain, but the point, but, but, but populist messaging is only effective in a, in a society where, um, the, the policymakers have failed to deliver tangible results to the population, because what is populism? Populism is a simple message to a complex problem. What populists do is they say, look, you have all of these problems that you're facing and I have a simple solution for you. Um, and that appeals to a population that isn't getting results from its government. And so whenever you see populist rhetoric emerge, it doesn't emerge from a vacuum. It emerges from a, from a society and a country that is already in turmoil because uh, the policies that have been enacted or haven't been enacted have failed their population. But I'm wondering what, what you think about this from a Pakistani perspective. Oh, right now we are right in in the heart of a populist wave in our country. You know, no, no questions asked about that. So Imran Khan, the ex prime minister of Pakistan, and probably by the you know results that we see uh, right now, this by elections that uh, kind of you know uh, just. Uh, uh, told us the way this um, country's uh, uh, politics is going to be, you know, uh, driven ahead and in which direction it's going to go. 
so Imran Khan definitely he also takes a lot of populist positions, uh, Pakistani identity crisis. Uh, he is a product of that. Um, his statements and his speeches, uh, they exploit every single uh, Pakistani identity crisis, insecurity that a young person has today. Uh, for example, he talks about Qaumi Gharat, the national integrity, where we will not bow down in front of, especially America, because Americans have been telling us for so long how to run our country. It's about time we say absolutely not. And the young population is responding to the message. Listen, when I was 18 or 20, I wanted to listen to these things because you're young, you're so idealist, you're so full of energy and ideas, and you want someone to tell you things are going to be okay, we're going to beat this. And while uh, and, and, and we are in a good place right now as, in, as a country, as a person, where we can take on um, anybody, uh, be it even a global power on the basis of our honesty, on the power of our faith. That is what he's telling, you know, the young population and they are responding to it. So when he says absolutely not, these young people, they want hope. They, 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 they think finally somebody is channelizing our anger. So there's a two way debate. Some people are saying that Imran is exploiting that anger. He's actually fanning, you know, that anger and just trying to kind of use it to achieve his political agenda, which is also partially true. But I believe that the anger has always been there. Nobody has been able to tap into it. And that is what Imran is doing. He's channelizing the anger of an average Pakistani, and especially being a society where there are a lot of other political and non-political factors who could kind of do that. For me, the win would be if a political party kind of takes the you know, uh, it takes the initiative. For example, let's discuss TLP. TLP has a huge following in young young population also. They have a very clear message where they're kind of focusing the religious sentiment of the population. And suddenly Imran Khan kind of slightly, you know, turns on his religious rhetoric, um, you know, uh, uh, narrative. And that population gravitates to Imran rather than the TLP. Uh, so again, it, it, it's a very complex situation. Is it ideal? No. But would I rather have a political party which um, which does which be, does not believe in violence, uh, playing up to that uh, you know uh, religious rhetoric tune? I don't know. It's a, it's a debate we still need to have in Pakistan also. Look, I attended. Um, I've had the, I've had the uh, the honor of attending both you know both a PTI Jalsa and a, a, a TLP Dharna, and in fact. You know, I purposely attended the PTI Jalsa at the end of March. I, I happened to be in Pakistan and I was curious about Imran Khan's Jalsa. And so I went and um, and I, I want to make a point about anti-Americanism here. Uh, I've never experienced anti-Americanism at the individual level. I've experienced it as a concept or as, as a general statement about the United States' alleged role in the world. And But I've never experienced it at the individual level such that even when I went to the uh, PTI Jalsa, I was, you know, chit-chatting with people who had signs that said, we won't return to Western slavery or signs that said, absolutely not. And I would talk to them and they'd, they'd say, oh, you know, my cousin lives in Houston. Yeah, I want to visit New York. And we'd have a cordial chat because anti-Americanism in Pakistan, in my experience, is all, very rarely expressed at the individual level. It's not personal. Um, I'm not justifying it, but I'm saying that I, you know, as an American in Pakistan, I haven't really experienced it on an individual level. Now, when I went to the PTI Jalsa, I, you know, it wasn't just a feeling of anger. It was a feeling of excitement. It did have, you know, I make the joke that it almost had the feeling of a rave uh, in which there, it was disproportionately young people and they, they were angry, but they were also excited about their future. And I think they saw, you know, that excitement and that hope reflected in this, in this, uh, in Imran Khan and in the way he challenged the status quo, that, that frustration, can't exist unless there were policy failures that predated. Again, that frustration is a product of policy failures. And it's it would be a mistake for the other political parties to focus on whether Imran Khan is 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 disingenuously chan channeling or not, channeling it or not. That's besides the point. The point is that there were policy failures that led to that discontent. And those policy policy failures need to be addressed because if Imran Khan doesn't channel it, somebody else will channel it. That takes me to TLP. 
I accidentally attended the TLP Dharna in 2017 because I had to, I passed through the Faisabad interchange and they were there. And so it was very much an accident, but I did witness it and I followed TL, TLP over the years. Uh, now TLP, uh, uh, Jal says, I wouldn't really say, I wouldn't characterize it as a mood of excitement so much as a mood of discontent. And I very much think that uh, TLP, uh, uh, regardless of its, its slogans or stated purposes, is channeling discontent in a, a deeply unequal society and is able to, is an outlet, is an outlet for that discontent that uh, stems from many other issues, including economic uh, disenfranchisement. And so, so long as you have a society that's unequal, so long as you have tens of millions of young people who have nowhere to go, uh, there are going to be, uh, there are going to need to be outlets for that. And those can be positive or negative outlets. And, uh, and I'll leave it at that. So, uh, Adam, you did not experience any anti-Americanism because there's a very, very funny uh, anecdote in Pakistan. Or, or, or I'd rather say it's a joke that everyone is anti-American as long as they don't, um, you know, but they do want to live in America. They do, uh, at some point of time, you know, want to visit there. Uh, and also, my generation is somebody who grew up watching Friends. So uh, for us, uh, you know, uh, when I first time went to America and I went to this coffee shop and the coffee shop person looked so familiar, I said, when I've seen this person before and I realized I've seen him somewhere in, in some movie on some television series because the casting is so accurate that the, the people that they show in the movies who are working at a you know, coffee shop looks exactly like somebody who would work in a co at a coffee place or an accountant or anybody, you know, you take anybody from different walks of life. So uh, for us, the American uh, um, concept is not that unfamiliar. We grew up watching a lot of American content, though these things are changing now. The current Pakistani uh, uh, youth has access to uh, Netflix and Prime Amazon and YouTube. They're looking at Korean content. They, they're they're looking at a lot of European content, a lot of British content. So for us, American entertainment was a major, major part of our growing up. Um, so uh, the, the things probably would change with time. And also you have to see the Imran's message was so brilliant. So the first day he took off is, you know, what his opening uh, line was, he said, Ghabrana nahi hai. So which in English means, youth of my country, do not be afraid. You know, uh, in a way, saying that everything's going to be okay since I'm here now. And for someone who's young, that message is so powerful. No one else in this country is telling young people, you will be okay. Someone is out there to look out for you. Though in policies and in governance, that did not happen. It did not translate into anything actionable during his three and a half years. Uh, but just because he says, I see you and I hear you, and I know what you want. You know, I'm here, I'm going to take care of it. People went crazy. You know, it, it's, it's a, such a popular slogan now. It's, in, in drawing room scenario, we just throw this <laughs> phrase at each other <laughs> whenever, you know, the conversation is stuck. So, Ghabrana nahi hai became his slogan, you know. Because this the resulting message to young people in the United States and Pakistan from political elites has been, wait your turn. And yeah, uh, yeah. that's falling on deaf ears now. Yeah, so when he's saying, you know, I'm here, don't be afraid. Even if you're not an Imran Khan follower, you would say maybe, maybe things will be different this time around, though they weren't. Having said that, whatever, whatever is happening in Pakistan right now, again, it's very unprecedented because the same Imran Khan who was performing badly would be, you know, kind of like a very, very sharp word. Who was, uh, he was, his, his performance was disappointing is the word that I'm going to use whether it would be in terms of policy decisions um, or, uh, you know, the economy, uh, in the, the, the promises that he made to his followers, to his constituency, a lot of them were not kept. Let this, let this, let's put it that way. But one month out of office, he's coming back with full force again and again on the backs of these young people who still have some hope in him because others have disappointed these this youth so much that they 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 want to try him again 
Well, look, in, in defense of, uh, of uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan, and I'll even say in defense of President Biden and in defense of other past leaders in both countries, whenever they come with these, these grandiose ideas for change, then they're immediately uh, you know, up to their knee in bureaucracy and a very, a very inefficient bureaucracy in both, both countries. Um, and, and so I think change is very slow, and that's another source of discontentment for young people. Um, you know, I think about the United States and generationally, there's, there's a generational gap at play, which is that I think, you know, the, the boomer generation, or let, let's just say people over 50, um, they think that regardless of the outcomes in the United States, regardless of the dysfunctions that we're seeing, and by the way, people on both on all you know both sides of the aisle can agree that there's dysfunction. Conservatives and liberals both agree there's dysfunction. Um, but the older generation of of Americans will say, well, but what's most important is that these institutions remain intact. So mm. even if you think that the Supreme Court's not not representative, or it, what's most important is that the Supreme Court remains intact and that it remains unaltered. Or if you don't you don't think that uh, you you know you. You don't think that it's possible to work across the aisle, but it's important to do that just for the optics of it. Whereas I think mm. young Americans say, no, we want to fight the system itself. And mm. we don't assign, we don't inside, we don't assign this blank check of value to these institutions. Um, and I think uh, some of that might be true in Pakistan as well, though I'd be curious about your thoughts about that. But basically, you know, even the most charismatic of leaders who wants to see change is going to be up against uh, institutional bureaucracies that, traditionally speaking, resist change. Hmm. So true. Another interesting topic that I think a lot of Pakistanis uh, would, you know, uh, be uh, you know, interested in knowing about is the effect of the foreign policy that, uh, especially the American expansionism and the foreign policy decisions and the kind of indirect or direct meddling in in the Pakistani political and you know social affairs. That's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of anger in that too. Um, we do like American people, but we do not like American government. There's a clear divide, at least in you know in our minds. We do understand that American people are not wholly and solely responsible for the American policy, especially what's been happening in Afghanistan, the spillover of the uh, 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 radicalized ideology, which was, by the way, facilitated by our own corrupt and ambitious elite and you know power brokers. So I won't take that away from them. But the kind of hypocrisy that we see from the American establishment and, and the American uh policy makers or whoever is in power at that time that is very problematic for pakistan and that's why it's become so easy to kind of build that anti-american narrative and a lot of people do vote on that by the way in the kp the khyber Pakhtunkhwa province governments do kind of uh, you know sell this narrative it's and it kind of works in their way also they do get votes on anti-americanism not in other parts of countries though well, I think when I look at when I try to uh, look at my own country's foreign policy with a critical eye, and let's just use Pakistan as an example or Afghanistan as an example, I, you know, the United States at different times has done a lot for Pakistan. The U.S. government has done a lot for Pakistan at different times, but we're also terrible, absolutely terrible at putting ourselves in the shoes of others, especially when it comes to foreign policy. You talk to the average, the average American isn't even thinking about Pakistan, but the average I American, the Sorry. average American. US, I thought when I'll, I'll land in US and people would be so, you know, invested in, you know, Pakistan's politics, they would be so interested in the Pakistan, what's happening in Pakistan. And they were just doing their average, you know, work. They were driving their bikes on the weekend, doing, you know, <laughs> hiking and canoeing and, you know, living their lives unaffected so yeah that's also a reality check for us when we go there yeah pakistan is not a topic of conversation for the average american but let's just think about american policymakers who do think about pakistan and you ask them well in the last 20 years what was a point where you think there was a real turning point in this relationship that made it sour and they'll point to the to, to the to the raid in abadabad where, where they they found osama bin laden they won't mention salala happened in the same year. I mean, 
And I mention that because I think sometimes we Americans lack empathy and lack the ability to put ourselves in other shoes. Can you imagine if Pakistan had negligently killed 24 U.S. soldiers uh, in an incident like that all at once uh, in Afghanistan, the absolute fallout there would have been? Now, what folks listening in Washington would say to this is, well, Pakistan's support for, for the Haqqani network or what have you killed more Americans than that. But that's besides the point. Uh, whether we accept that is true or not, that's besides the point. Uh, the point is, if an incident like Salala had been reversed, it would have led to a fallout that would have lasted for years. So I think we have to at least recognize uh, that Pakistan sustained real grievances in the war on terror. I don't accept all the blame on, on Washington for the radicalization of Pakistan society. I think Pakistan made some very poor choices when it came to who to support and who not to support and who what groups to prop up and what groups not to prop up. And I think that came back to haunt them. And I think it's still coming back to haunt Pakistan in the form of TTP. But I will say that Pakistan and Pakistan, the Pakistani people and the Pakistani military experienced real losses in the war on terror. I mean, I believe there was an incident where, where a mosque near GHQ was attacked. I think there, there was the incident of the Army Public School in Peshawar. There was the incident of Salala. Right? We can name incident after incident after incident where the Pakistani people suffered. And I do not think that was acknowledged enough in Washington by policymakers who should have known better uh, and should have acknowledged it. So I will say that. Uh, that is true about the United States. But, uh, you know, Americans are also discontent with our own foreign policy. If you poll after poll shows that Americans want to see a less interventionist less interventionist in the form of military intervention foreign policy we still want to have a strong military we still want to have a presence in the world we still want to have a uh, soft power and, and and the ability to protect ourselves and our allies but we don't want to have this era of you know we're, we're trying to leave behind this era of drone strikes this era of military invasions um, but even even among even within the american population i just don't I, I don't think there's always a sense of just how ridiculous some of our actions looked to people in this part of the world, such as the invasion of Iraq. I mean, and what that did uh, to to uh, the image of America. I think that is sometimes lost on on Americans in general and our policymakers. So, is an average American young person emotionally invested in their politics and then their foreign policy? as much as Pakistanis are, because we live, eat, drink, breathe, dream about politics all the time. You must have witnessed that. No, I, I always make the joke that bookstores in Islamabad are among, from, for, in terms of foreign policy uh, and history books, are the best bookstores in, in, in the world. Uh, I, would, uh, I, I would actually take Saeed Book Bank over a lot of bookstores in the United States in terms of its, its, its voluminous variety of, of books on <laughs> current affairs. And it is true that Pakistanis do talk about politics and international relations almost the way Americans talk about sports. And I think that has to do with the vulnerability of Pakistan and the way that international relations really does do impact the lives of Pakistanis in a very immediate way. And perhaps the average American is more disconnected from that. Um, but, I, but I think there is a, a increased awareness in the United States as to how our domestic policy and our foreign policy is linked and the way we spent, you know, uh, unimaginable amounts of money on military intervention abroad and on the Department of Defense. And I think there's a feeling that some of that money would be better spent elsewhere. So I think there's an awakening going on, especially if you look at polling from Gen Z. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but certainly Americans do not think about foreign policy nearly as much as Pakistanis do. I think that's a, I think that, I think that's a, a reality. Yeah, and also we don't even watch a lot of, uh, you know, entertainment on our television. So most of the times we'll just watch uh, our news channels because there's a lot happening in Pakistan all the time. In case you haven't witnessed this past week, we were in a breaking news scenario every day, every minute. And uh, somehow I don't think it's far from over yet. More uh, political, uh, you know, instability and the uh, uh, events that will lead us to an early election. We're going to witness that in coming weeks. Uh, and also, uh, for example, in Pakistan, there's another, uh, what do you call this, anger or disappointment or again, a hypocrisy um, aspect of this relationship of America and Pakistan and how it is different whenever a dictator is in control in our country uh, and how conveniently uh, that has been used by the U.S. 
and also Pakistani dictators have used that leverage uh, to kind of strengthen their hold uh, on the you know on power and it goes both ways you scratch my back I'll scratch yours and then kind of you know uh, the policy outcome of that it's it's it, it has uh, um, this, it's, it's, it's destructive for the Pakistani social fabric. But the way it's so conveniently the American government legitimizes the role of military in this country, uh, for example, we should be talking to the president or the prime minister or the political leadership, but completely bypassing them and directly talking to the military leadership a lot of times when the political leadership is not even in the room. So that is also problematic. And a lot of policymakers and serious critical thinkers in this country find that problematic. Well, I've always said, look, we the United States loves to talk about the civil military imbalance. And then in some ways, they benefit, we benefit from the civil military imbalance in the short term. I'll give a very mm -hmm. I'll give an example away from the past. Mm -hmm. The ultimatums that were handed to Pervez Musharraf mm -hmm. after 9-11 were only possible under military rule. Had 9-11 occurred during a period of true civilian rule, and the Bush administration had handed a, a civilian, a Pakistani civilian government, hey, you're with us or against us, and, you, and here's the list of demands, and you absolutely need to, need to do this. Those would have, a government that was truly accountable to the Pakistani people would have, would have, would have taken their time. There would have, wouldn't have been this expedient response. Uh, it wouldn't have been so convenient. Uh, they would have had to debate this in, 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 in parliament and, and it would have been a drawn out process. So at times the United States has benefited from the expediency uh, of military rule. But at the end of the day, I do believe the, the, the disposition of the Pakistani government is ultimately the responsibility of Pakistanis. And look, the United States is going to have to work with who's in power. And I certainly wouldn't advocate a US foreign policy that turns away from Pakistan or any country, depending on who or who, who is or isn't in power, because I think that leads to all kinds of other dysfunctions. And uh, at times, uh, the military has presented itself as the more competent actor versus civilian, uh, civilian uh, uh, leaders. And that is a self-inflicted wound by civilian leaders. It's, uh, uh, and, and, and so it needs to be addressed. Absolutely. This is the problem of Pakistani political class, that if someone else thinks uh, th there's a perception that someone else is more competent uh, and is more able to, uh, you know, successfully run the, uh, um, the the government. Then it's their problem, and they should fix it. And that's exactly what's you know happening in Pakistan right now. The young uh, population is asking these questions. So right now, uh, the relationship between America and Pakistan are kind of in a very very shaky ground. Here's Imran Khan, who is saying, "I was thrown out by America." and uh, the US uh, backed regime change, operation regime change. By the way, he has a proper term for it and it's being well received by his audience. They genuinely believe that the US is behind this regime change. And then we have this new government, this uh, PMLN led coalition. Obviously the establishment and the governments want to have cordial relationship where well, Imran Khan is right now at the back and any sort of softness or thorness between the stance uh, uh, between this relationship between America and U.S. is seen, he's going to bank on it politically. So did, where do we go from here? <laughs> well, look, Maria, I'd, act I'd actually rather ask you that question, but I'll give my answer and then maybe you can tell me how you see the future of U.S.-Pakistan relations. I do believe in this relationship. I, I believe in the potential of Pakistan. I believe that the, the I believe that the relationship of the United States and Pakistan is an important one. I think it's intrinsically important. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I've always believed it should be dehyphenated from other countries. I think it was held hostage by outcomes in Afghanistan for the last 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. I think we should have a bilateral relationship that recognizes the importance of Pakistan in and of itself. I think Pakistanis also have to recognize, and this includes Mr. Imran Khan, the importance of the United States to Pakistan. We're the number one destination for Pakistani ex exports. We have people-to-people uh, -people ties that are incredibly strong. When I meet young Pakistanis, very few of them tell me I see my future in Shanghai. They often you know, want to live in New York or Houston or wherever. Uh, we have the United States is, I think, the number one destination of Pakistani. Well, I mean, it, of course, it would be the only destination of Pakistani Fulbrights. But what I mean to say is that 
Pakistanis make up the largest group of Fulbrights going to the United States, or at least the second largest. We have academic exchanges. We have people to people exchanges. We even have some shared history and shared values. Uh, and we certainly have economic, uh, an economic relationship that's, that's growing. And I see a lot of potential in that. I believe in it. I think it will overcome the politics of the day. Um, and I think the United States should work with whoever is in power, whether that whether that be the current government or that whether that whether that be Imran Khan or anyone else. And I think the United States will do that. And I think uh, Pakistanis, at the end of the day, regardless of the regime change rhetoric, they recognize the importance of the United States to the future of Pakistan too. But Absolutely. I guess I, I, I would give you the last word. And what do you think about the future of this relationship? I think this relationship is. A, it, it, it's one of the most interesting relationship with any country. Uh, you know, Pakistanis love American products. They love American content. Uh, they want to visit America at some point of time. If you give them an American passport or green card, they will absolutely accept it. But you have to understand that the foreign policy effect that has spilled over in our country, again, facilitated by our own leaders. I'm not going to give them a free ticket or free pass out of it. That is a debate that right now Pakistanis need to take up with their own leadership. We kind of see the difference between the American people and the American administration. An average Pakistani really does see that. I think what Anran Khan doing is, again, very interesting because he understands that the relationship will sustain uh, no matter what narrative he builds. And I think Washington also understands that sometimes it politically leaders do exploit the anti-Americanism sentiment to get some political leverage. And they, I think they understand what Imran is doing. So if even if he comes back in power, the relationship, though slightly you know, shaky at the first, uh, in the first few months or so, I think they will get back to. And also it depends on, uh, uh, you know, um, on a lot of other factors, the time and space at that time and, and what are the commonalities these countries decide to come together on the basis of um it, it's it's a long time to predict uh you know uh, what's going to happen in the next six or eight months the global politics is changing rapidly rapidly so we don't know we might end up being you know bigger allies and more stronger allies in future depending on the foreign policy or whatever the political uh you know um spectrum is when when and if there's a new leadership in Pakistan if it and if it's Imran Khan so it was quite interesting conversation Adam I, I learned a lot about you know the American system and how it works and uh, and I think uh, there were a lot of misconceptions are at our end also and it's, it was a good reality check <laughs> thanks for uh, sharing your views with us it was great chatting I wish we had more time and it was very interesting to hear your perspectives as well Absolutely. And with this, we come to an end. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, did you enjoy our conversation? Do leave your comment you know, beneath this uh, YouTube video. Thank you.